So friends, uh, uh, welcome to this, uh, the Silver Jubilee week of the Saturday Manufacturing Talks. We are at the 25th week. Uh, we started, uh, you know, in the month of March. You know, the uh, today's talk would be on the high productivity welding process for pipeline uh, construction. Now, as you know, the, the welding is uh, one of the most important manufacturing uh, domain. Because welding, we consider it as the last stage of the operation where the assembly is getting done, assembly of the components. So we have to be very, very careful about the process and process. And, uh, uh, you know, the, we also think of the automation of the process, how automation can be brought in in, the, in in case of the welding. Now, because of the discovery of the newer type of the materials and sometimes also the demand for high productivity, the researchers are struggling, struggling a lot to find out the appropriate welding process. There are different, there are new uh, types of welding process are, um, you know, they're coming up. The problem becomes even more complex or uh, difficult when the welding of the large structure needs to be, in, in, I mean, is the concern. So today's talk would be on that high productivity welding process for pipeline construction. We are privileged to have today uh, Professor Adrian Jerlik from University of Waterloo. Professor Jerlik is the Associate Professor in the Department of Mechanical and Mechatronics Engineering University of Waterloo and Director of the Center for Advanced Material Joining. Professor Jerlik is an expert in material science, microscopy, welding, and material characterization. His most significant recent contributions are in the area of joining of dissimilar materials and friction star welding. Jernick has led a research team of an average of 10 research and graduate students. He has secured more than 2.9 million US dollar in operational funding and more than 5 million US dollar in infrastructure for welding and materials processing that will support the proposed research. He has over 170 publications in peer reviewed journals. So let us hear from Professor Jerry about the high productivity welding process. Professor Jerry. Thank you. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll sh share my screen. Here. That's uh, loading up here. So um, as I uh, as I said, we've uh, been kind of under lockdown, and as you can see, I'm uh, in my home office here. I have my guitar collection that I was able to put up. Finally, have a place to to put them on display. So rather than having a one of those backgrounds that some people use, I have actual uh, some nice pieces of uh, music to look at, um, instruments to look at. Um, so my uh, background is actually, I, after I graduated from the University of Toronto, I was actually at the University of Alberta for about four years there. There was a welding center at the University of Alberta that had, um, um, that had basically uh, a professor that had retired and then was kind of dormant for a few years. Uh, they hired myself and then uh, Patricio Mendes was hired a few years later then. Uh, that kind of restarted that center, but uh, then this opportunity came up for me here in the University of Waterloo, and Waterloo is actually one of the uh, kind of the main, one of the two main uh, universities that are focusing on welding specifically in the uh, materials undergraduate program. We offer a specialization in our materials, uh, uh, our mechanical engineering program that focuses on materials and welding. And uh, that specialization is kind of unique in Canada. So uh, we certainly are, are doing quite well in, in terms of our recognition at the undergraduate level, but also on the, the research side of things as well. Uh, so aside from myself, there's about the three or four other professors that are now focusing exclusively on uh, welding related uh, research. So um, what I wanted to do uh, today with this talk is just give you some background in terms of uh, over the last uh, several years it's sort of research directions that we've been focusing on uh, pipelines uh, so those are uh, part of the original work is actually mostly 
related to a, a industrial research chair program. Our government has, uh, has had these research chair programs um, that uh, help to uh, recruit new faculty members and uh, re you know, start up new research areas in areas of, of, of focus that are important to Canada. Uh, so, having said that, uh, certainly uh, welding of pipelines is, is a very important area for us in Canada. Uh, we have, uh, you know, on the order of, of 50,000 kilometers of uh, pipeline for both natural gas uh, and oil. Um, you probably have, have heard about quite a lot of the uh, oil uh, oil sands production that's over in Alberta. And uh, much of that is um, uh, transported by pipelines down to uh, both the United States and Texas and uh, to the East Coast as well. There's a small, there's one refinery there in Canada as well. Uh, so certainly we have a, a lot of uh, pipeline related research that's uh, actively going on and a lot of need for both uh, maintaining the current pipeline system, uh, but also some new pipelines are, are being built as well. There's one that's uh, specifically uh, being built uh, to uh, transport natural gas, uh, in particular to the west coast in Vancouver. Uh, so there's there's a lot of activity in this area uh, even now. So in, in terms of pipeline construction, um, there's something rather uh, special about um, the requirements in pipeline in the pipeline industry. Um, so for most applications, when we talk about um, string based design, that's that's not really a commonly taught subject in undergraduate studies. Most of our undergraduate studies, we you know take a mechanical approach of analyzing you know a component, analyzing the stresses on that component, and designing everything so that uh, the geometry and the loading never exceeds the yield strength. And usually maybe by a factor of two or three, it's much, much lower than the yield stress of the material. Uh, well, in the pipeline industry, it's totally different. We actually expect that for a pipeline that the yield strength is going to be exceeded. So the yield stresses uh, typically are going to be exceeded at some point and there is an expectation that some plastic deformation uh, is going to happen uh, in the pipeline itself because of uh, the impossible to control geological shifts. So there is always some movement uh, in the ground. Uh, this is not necessarily, um, it can be uh, something like an earthquake type of event, but usually it's rather kind of slow progressive movements um, because soil and everything in the soil is, is changing from time to time. So that brings us to a very difficult challenge in that we have to actually design all of the processes and the materials, not just to be satisfactorily strong, but actually sustain a, a, a fair amount of strain deformation before fracturing. Now, in most cases, most steels nowadays, uh, we typically expect that almost all engineering materials should have, you know, at least five to 10% uh, strain capacity, right? Uh, so that's a, a typical thing, but we need to actually ensure that this kind of strain capacity is met both in the weld metal and the base metal of the pipeline and in the heat affected zone of that pipeline material. So uh, this brings a lot of challenges. So subtle changes in welding consumable chemistry can result in major changes in the mechanical output, especially when we start to change how much heat input is coming from the welding process. And we also try to kind of manage that by controlling the actual heat input using, you know, different and new welding processes and trying to optimize those processes so that it minimizes the effect on the heat affected zone of the material. Now, um, in Canada, what you see is that quite a lot of the, uh, the welding uh, of pipelines is actually done in this kind of, I don't know if you can see my, my cursor, maybe I'll uh, try to go to this pointer here. Uh, 
Um, if you look at this kind of uh, arrangement here, a lot of the pipeline often has to be uh, built around like through the entire year, which means a significant number of months, a few months is at least potentially in the winter time and sometimes a minus 20 degrees Celsius kind of temperatures. And in order to manage the welding process, oftentimes what they will do is use these basically these little huts, these little tents, uh, which are actually uh, a rigid structure, which go over all the locations where the pipeline is being joined. And then you have a controlled environment where there is uh, a more comfortable temperature for the welders so that they, they also the, the uh, cooling rate of the actual pipe material doesn't accelerate too fast so that it doesn't uh, produce unexpected results in, in the welding process, but it also minimizes how much wind may be blowing on the arc torch and so on. And uh, usually they're in kind of sets of three like this because we oftentimes need to have either different welding um, consumable wire or sometimes even different settings on the power supply to do the root pass, fill pass, and cap pass. So that's why you see three of these little shacks on the joint. So they will basically do those passes and then all these three will move down to the next one so that the fill, uh, so that the root cap and fill passes are all done always the same way every time and that welders don't have to keep changing settings, changing wires, changing torches to get into the different uh, passes of the weld. And the reason for that is because most of these welds are basically typically quite thick uh, on the order of um, uh, usually uh, from at least about seven millimeters all the way up to 25 millimeters, uh, sometimes even 30 millimeters, but usually uh, typically on the order of about seven to 20 millimeters in thickness. And because of that, it takes a quite a bit of time. And uh, so most of the welding, at least in Canada, is typically done using this kind of a semi-automatic machine. Basically, we have a carriage system that's strapped to the pipe and uh, a welder is typically watching the welding process, making sometimes small adjustments in terms of the, uh, the current or position of the torch and making these small adjustments as that carriage moves around and completes the weld. So one is going from the top and then they go on the other side and go uh, around the other side. And so, as I said, typically we have multiple passes because the thickness is really quite high. And so this implies that often we have to, we have to actually have um, a multiple pass weld, which has areas or locations where the heat affected zone may be reheated more than once. That brings in some uh, additional challenges and some more complex microstructures. Um, most of these semi-automatic welding systems often require, uh, uh, they often use actually a fairly specific and very uh, tightly controlled root geometry, which is actually a fairly narrow gap root geometry. It's, it's not necessarily called narrow gap, but it, it is uh, typically a fairly specific, uh, close, tight geometry uh, that's optimized for the mechanized welding uh, carriage and the torches that they use. Now, trying to optimize um, the welding process for high productivity um, has been a, a study of great interest for many years. Uh, essentially, it's a problem of trying to deposit as much metal as possible, as fast as possible, with as few defects and hopefully none, uh, uh, if, if we can. And uh, the processes these days are really quite good at doing that. Um, a very common approach to doing it is this dual uh, tandem uh, configuration where sometimes it may be two torches in a dual torch configuration where these two torches are passed and filling more than double the amount of material usually in one pass typically because each torch may actually contain uh, two wires and that's kind of a, 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 a novel technique that's been developed in the last uh, 10 years uh, that allows you to go much faster and imposes, uh, uh, it can allow much faster travel speeds and fill rates. However, more heat is also involved because these two torches are both quite close together. And once the first torch passes, the uh, cooling rate after the second torch passes is going to be much slower because the, all the material is already highly preheated and al already very hot. Uh, so the heat input is really quite high and then the repeated heating and cooling cycles 
they then cause the deterioration of the heat affected zone. So one uh, process that we considered uh, that maybe can help to address this issue of these high cooling rates or high temperatures uh, and slow cooling rates is that perhaps we can add additional filler material by using simply a cold wire. So if we simply adopt the same standard uh, GMA torch, and if we use our MIG welding process or GMA process to deposit the material, and we already have a molten pool, we can <clears throat> maybe introduce more material into this pool because it's normally heated, uh, superheated above the melting point. So we can add more cold wire into that pool and still melt that wire because of the excess heat. That will hopefully also cause um, a certain kind of cooling effect that may help to minimize the damage to the heat affected zone or minimize the temperature at high temperature, uh, the time at high temperature in the heat affected zone. So cold wire feed rates, uh, we've been analyzing how this cold wire can be actually implemented in terms of both the angle, position, and feeding speed of that cold wire. The feeding speed is one of the main uh, uh, parameters, as you can expect. And we always, uh, because we have sometimes different wire diameter combinations, we always uh, normalize this feeding speed measurement as basically a, a mass fraction of the original uh, or of the electrode at the top. So we're adding 10 or 20 or 50 or 100% extra cold wire to the pool. So this is what the, uh, the setup actually looks like. Um, we have our standard welding torch and a cold wire feeder uh, trailing behind. It's really quite simple. And that is an important uh, point that we wanted to, to actually um, uh, emphasize is that it is a very simple technique by just adding another wire feeder. So the equipment is already technically already available. It's already on the site because usually you have multiple one or two extra wire feeders in case one breaks. The rollers sometimes break down or the drive motor can break down. And when you're in a very far remote location uh, doing pipeline welding, you may not have access to additional parts and supplies, uh, maybe for days or uh, at a time. So it's important to have a process that can be used with the existing equipment. One of the interesting things that we discovered though, as we started to first test out this cold wire process is that one um, uh, major advantage that we, we found was that you could actually weld much narrower gaps or closer together gap, more close together than possible and actually have a, a flat face uh, on that gap and still avoid any defects on the sidewalls. And the reason for that is because when the arc is striking, what will happen is if the, if the gap is too narrow, the arc will tend to attach to one side or the other side inconsistently if you were just using GMA. When you have a cold wire, what will happen is the arc will tend to attach to the cold wire and it will travel with the cold wire and be much more controllable and easy to direct into the gap that the weld metal is going. So uh, one of the things that we uh, tried to analyze was just to see how much of a, uh, an enhancing deposition rate we could achieve. Uh, typically, uh, we can achieve in the order of about 80% increase in the deposition rates. So of course, uh, when we're trying to do these, these uh, uh, fill and cap passes and trying to fill up the material, our uh, rate of fill is going to be much faster. We can typically fill with less passes of the torch. So that's a big advantage. But one concern is that um, potentially adding this cold wire can cause the power supply to increase the power requirement because this will actually interrupt the uh, arc length. The welding process can actually demand more power uh, when you start to increase the amount of metal that's actually being welted. And uh, it turns out that this increase actually is very nominal. It's, there's only about a around about a 10 to 12 percent increase in the arc current when you add 80 percent more wire. So we're able to actually uh, use a lot of the excess energy that's being um, 
introduced by the torch. So this is what a typical cross-section uh, looks like. These are some uh, early preliminary trials uh, comparing uh, the, the fill rate. And we can basically, uh, this uh, it basically shows that we can basically almost fill the same gap with two passes with the cold wire uh, process, whereas three passes would be required for this material with the traditional uh, GMA process. And the other major issue is, does it actually uh, reduce the heat that's actually exposed to the heat affected zone? And it certainly appears that that's the case. So when you look at the uh, micro hardness profiles, um, again, a, a major requirement is that all the hardness values kind of stay below 300 Vickers within the weld metal and cooling faster or having a lower temperature process um, that can cause a higher cooling rate that can give you excessive hardness in the weld metal. Now, the hardness does go, go up a little bit when, when we add the cold wire to it, but it's still within uh, an acceptable range. But the other major thing is that the heat affected zone is actually quite narrower. So if you look at how far our heat affected material is over here, uh, it's a few millimeters where it's on the order of about just under two millimeters for uh, the uh, cold wire process. So that's uh, certainly good news. And in uh, a lot of processes nowadays, uh, the major issue with, with uh, the heat affected zone is actually softening and how wide that heat affected zone actually is. When we look at our microstructures, um, we still have very good microstructures within uh, the, melt, the weld metal. Uh, so these are the uh, weld metals uh, produced with standard um, welding wire that's on the order of uh, 80 KSI kind of strength level. Um, and of course, with those welding wires, you, know, you typically see acicular ferrite structures and occasionally some islands of uh, polygonal ferrite or primary ferrite here and there. Uh, the cold wire actually has less of a fraction of those polygonal ferrites. It's almost more and almost entirely uh, composed of acicular ferrite. Uh, which is a, a very a good result, so it's exactly what you desire. The other feature is that, uh, quite surprisingly, is that they, um, the fusion line microstructures, and this is where you get the highest temperatures uh, in, in, in the base metal, they tend to actually produce very large coarse grains. Well, the larger coarse grains can produce very hard microstructures. Uh, so that's uh, one thing that is a good feature of this cold wire process is that uh, our coarse large grains in the heat affected zone or the fusion line are basically controlled. We almost have virtually no grain growth uh, along the fusion line here, as you can see um, by the, the appearance of these grains. They're all very fine grained acicular ferrite structures. So if we uh, look at trying to adopt uh, even more or improve even more deposition in the process, another possibility is to introduce two wires uh, because there seems to be capacity for having additional uh, heat kind of removed. And uh, in that case, the, the process can actually further be optimized and reduce the number of passes. In this case, we're looking at a, a, an even thicker material. And <clears throat> we're able to fill that with uh, only uh, six passes here, whereas standard GMA takes about 11 passes uh, to completely fill that joint. So we make a further improvement by adding even more uh, wire with two, two wires. Um, now, the, the main uh, thing about trying to add two wires rather than just feeding one wire faster is that uh, there tends to not be enough time for the wire to melt completely if you just try to feed a single cold wire twice as fast. It, the, heat that, the heat source that you're actually using to melt the, the cold wire is partly the arc, the plasma, and partly the molten pool itself. And the arc plasma is very spread out. So you need, it actually works in your favor to feed two wires from two different angles and absorb more of the energy. So uh, having two wires definitely does uh, 
improve uh, the fill rate and makes it more efficient. However, there is also a, a slight increase in hardness and it's getting close to the 30 uh, Vickers. There are some areas that are slightly over 300 Vickers uh, hardness within the, the weld metal with the double cold wire. So that still uh, requires some process optimization. And basically it, it means that you can start using slightly higher heat input for the torch to help melt those wires more completely. However, one interesting thing um, that we find when we compare the mechanical properties of the uh, single cold wire and double cold wire joints is that uh, the mechanical properties are, are further improved. Now, if you look at the, uh, the traditional uh, GMA joints, they achieve about 30, uh, sorry, about 5% strains before fracture. But the other interesting feature, important feature that we need to consider is how much of a strain hardening level we actually achieve with the process. And the difference between the yield strength and the UTS strength are very important for the strain-based design. And that double cold wire technique actually further improves that parameter by quite a bit. We do lose a little bit of, of overall strain, but the important feature to actually achieve the strain based design is how much this uh, jump it actually is from the yield to the UTS. So that strain hardening capacity is one of the main things that really drives uh, the, the fracture toughness when it's actually in the field. Now, of course, uh, reducing uh, the, um, the cycle time and the arc time by having fewer fill passes will certainly give the a uh, reduction in labor time and labor costs and so on. So uh, we can certainly achieve a, a major reduction by going to this kind of double cold wire uh, system. Um, and interestingly, uh, as I said, most of the, the uh, welding of pipelines in Canada is this uh, automatic and semi-automatic technique because manual welding uh, really is, is very costly here with the high labor costs. Now, of course, in, in other countries uh, around the world, often the manual welding may be lower cost and uh, it does not pay to use auto automated or semi-automatic systems. Well, as far as other processes, of course, there's many different ways uh, to weld uh, materials together. And we've uh, actually been able to acquire some new welding equipment for um, laser welding of pipeline materials. And hybrid laser welding uh, typically involves a laser combined with an arc, or also could be combined with things like a hot wire. A uh, hot wire here being resistively heated wire that can be introduced into the weld pool to provide some filling. Uh, another interesting technological development for laser welding is the use of these so-called wobbling heads. And the idea there is that by moving the laser at a very high speed, uh, you're able to do two things. One is that uh, you can actually agitate uh, the molten pool uh, so that it can help to release some entrapped gases or porosity. Uh, another thing that it can help is to actually uh, mix the materials together and, and actually provide uh, basically stirring uh, into the molten pool. So there's some commercial uh, products of welding heads that basically use this um, uh, gal galvanometers to oscillate the beam. And you can achieve a few different uh, shapes for the oscillation. Uh, we can oscillate in a simple circle, uh, linear back and forth, a figure eight, front ways or back or sideways. And all of these will have slightly different uh, characteristics in terms of uh, the trailing cooling rate uh, imposed by the actual laser beam because it's combined with the velocity of motion, we get uh, quite a large variation in the laser spot velocity. Well, the advantages, as I said, uh, of wobbling the laser, uh, it can induce better melt flow, uh, it can improve the temperature distribution to be more favorable for uh, different uh, phase transformations. Uh, we can improve bridging of a gap. So uh, the challenge with laser welding typically is that the, the tolerance or the, the gap has to be very, very narrow. Uh, 
So we can overcome that a little bit more easily with a wobbling uh, laser. Uh, and as I said, suppression of, of pores, especially for uh, materials like aluminum. However, a few people have analyzed uh, the role of, of wobble laser welding on uh, pipeline materials. And so we wanted to look at that in the case of a, a relatively you know, common or highly used uh, uh, steel, which is the X70 steel. Uh, we found that yes, we can achieve uh, some interesting results with this wobble laser. Um, one of the typical problems that often happens with a traditional laser welding on that material is that you tend to get a lot of ejection uh, of material and spatter. And along with the spatter, you tend to get a lot of undercut. And so the wobbling of the laser actually avoids a lot of the spatter. It's a very nice process to help avoid that. It actually is a much, much cleaner looking weld, very nice looking weld. You see there's maybe one or two little spatters here. But overall, it's a much more, uh, a much more cosmetically nice looking weld with the wobbling. The other question is, <clears throat> how does the actual weld profile change? Because uh, wobbling will distribute the heat more, uh, but there is uh, a major difference here in terms of the uh, parameters of the laser that you use for wobbling. Typically for wobbling, the spot size is very, very small and then you move it around. Whereas for typical laser welding, the spot size here for, in this case, it's a six kilowatt laser weld, is on the order of 600 microns. So what we've done is basically use a much finer spot and moved it by 0.5 millimeters or 500 microns back and forth so that the weld area or fusion zone is close to the same size, close to the same dimensions but interestingly, you actually get much better penetration, of course, because the spot size is smaller and you have a more intense uh, focused beam with higher energy density. So that's a good thing. We can achieve higher penetration, still melt the same volume of material, meaning that the gap uh, tolerance can still be the same, can still be quite manageable, but you have much higher penetration with the wobbling. And uh, so when we look at the microstructures, there is, of course, uh, some good evidence that the wobbling or the mixing of the uh, molten material helps to break up the grains during solidification. So if you look at uh, the standard weld without any wobbling, you have very long, continuous uh, columnar grains, whereas adding the wobbling definitely makes a more chaotic and broken up grain structure. Uh, much shorter columnar grains are observed with the wobbling process. We'll look at this a little bit more closely, the kinds of microstructures that are actually generated within that uh, fusion zone. Again, remember that this is without any filler material, so this is uh, going to be relatively high hardness microstructures because the cooling rates are actually very, very fast. However, we still end up with uh, uh, quite a lot of upper bainite material we still see, we do see some martensite in um, small fractions here and there. Uh, but overall, the, the microstructures are still containing a mixture of upper bainite and, and uh, martensite. Uh, the circle traditional or, or uh, without wobbling achieves a little bit softer microstructure with some primary ferrite or grain boundary ferrite and upper bainite within the structure. Uh, but in terms of the hardness, uh, interestingly, the hardness distributions are fairly similar, fairly comparable between all of the processes. So it's really the overall uh, heat input that has uh, maintained a similar hardness profile, not much of a, a, a damaging effect due to the wobbling effect. Um, it's basically just given you the advantage of fusing together a wider uh, uh, width of the material by wobbling while maintaining the penetration depth uh, using the wobbling process. <clears throat> now, uh, the one kind of challenge with all of the hardness profiles is that we do exceed 300 Vickers, which is not desirable, but uh, keep in mind that this is uh, without any filler material, so we can reduce the hardness by changing to or adding a, a softer metal to fill. Uh, 
Uh, the other thing is there's no preheat used. We just wanted to see what was the effect without any preheating of the base metal. So normally we do preheat material uh, in pipeline welding, even in the field. Now, <clears throat> doing a little bit more work on uh, pipelines, the traditional pipeline uh, materials, again, as I mentioned, a, a major challenge has been trying to understand how to control properties in the heat affected zone. And we've done quite a lot of work on this area. And the main kind of challenge is to basically maintain microstructures that are free of uh, what we call local brittle zones in the heat affected zone. So when we look at a heat affected zone, uh, you have this nice uh, classic diagram that shows all the different zones for steels. So we have our coarse grain zone and fine grained and intercritical and subcritical. And <clears throat> Within our intercritical zone, um, there is a range where the material gets heated to between AC1 and AC3 over here. So within that range, you have a kind of a mixture of ferrite and gamma or austenite. Within that time period, some of that austenite can have the opportunity to change into martensite. And oftentimes this will produce what's called a martensite austenite or MA. Uh, grain structure. That's not necessarily desirable and there's a lot of debate and speculation about you know what size morphology and fraction of MA is acceptable to have because it can have enough brittle material to cause uh, a brittle fracture and limit the strain during the strain based design deformations, right? So we have to manage this and be careful attention to this MA. Of course, MA is going to form in this zone during this intercritical heating, and it specifically is, is forming most easily when you spend time in between this AC1 and AC3 temperature zone, right? In the 850 degree uh, range, plus or minus uh, 50 degrees there. Uh, that's really the critical uh, zone of temperature that you really have a lot of MA forming. Now, one of the reasons it's been so difficult to find uh, conclusive uh, 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 conclusive papers discussing the role of MA is that it has a combination of the two phases, martensite and austenite. Well, austenite is actually a fairly soft phase, so how much of austenite and martensite is in it has a big effect. The other thing is the morphology of the phase. So if they are long and slender, so length that's three times the width and a nice slender, that will change the effect in terms of the, the impact on properties. Blocky will be more round. And they tend to have, traditionally are expected to have a, a worse impact. And they appear actually as a, these sort of white phases when you etch with lepera etching. So they can be actually difficult to find uh, during microscopy as well. So there's still a lot of, of research being done on this MA uh, even now, even though it's been studied for at least 40 years, we still have to pay attention to this phase in uh, modern pipeline steels. So uh, the fractions, so you tend to also change their morphology when you have different fractions of MA. And sometimes we can expect to have like three to 5% MA within the microstructure. So we often see a kind of a mixture of elongated and massive or blocky type of structures. And the big concern is that uh, during impact, MA can tends to be a potential initiator for cracks. So um, trying to understand the role of MA requires a lot of careful uh, thermal simulation, trying to actually replicate exactly the welding thermal profile and then control how much time and, and how fast you cool from this intercritical region around 850 Celsius. So uh, this is some work that we did where we were comparing, for example, different cooling rates coming out of this 850C at two and 10, Celsius per second, which kind of replicates submerged arc welding or gas metal arc welding, respectively. And uh, then we devised a sample geometry for the Glebal test uh, thermal simulation, 
which could be later used in a notch test or a Sharpie impact test. And what we find is that after uh, cycling, after the first primary welding cycle, we get this kind of a microstructure and then reheating that to the intercritical zone is when you're seeing a lot of this MA start to form. So this <clears throat> 2C per second actually forms a lot of these islands. And this is this Lepera etchant I was talking about. It's not very easy to see after nidal etching, but after Lepera, you see these MA phases appearing as this kind of light, sometimes white or blue, light blue kind of phases. And they're very, very fine and more evenly distributed here when we cool faster at 10C per second. Uh, one of the challenges is that um, although you have this different distribution, you also end up having a different property in the actual hardness of those MA themselves. So what tends to happen is that the slower cooling tends to be a softer material, the hardness is lower, uh, and this is done using nano indentation. So we can make actual indents only on those grains and measure the properties of individual uh, islands of this MA. We find that this 10C per second produces a harder MA, even though they are smaller particles, more evenly distributed, they are harder structure. And uh, that's going to cause a bit of a problem. And it turns out that this is causing uh, a lower toughness results when we cool faster and have a lot of small hard grains within the material rather than more dispersely uh, 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 contained softer grains of MA because those are clearly seen to be fracture initiators. So we can actually see little microvoids initiating in both of the materials. Uh, they do this uh, initiation uh, effect. However, with a larger fraction of those particles and harder particles in the fast cooling sample, we tend to get more of these initiation zones and thus we get lower toughness. Um, so we also did some modeling to try and, and figure out why um, or explain better why this is happening. And it's really because of the high hardness and the high yield strength of the hard MA phases. What tends to happen is that when you apply stress on the material, right? So if we apply stress this way, we have very, very high stress, local stress concentrations. So even if we apply stress of only, uh, this is done using modeling of the actual microstructure. If we apply a stress well under the yield stress, we see that there's actually very high hardness or high stress locations at the microscopic level, actually exceeding more than a thousand MPA at the microscopic level, wherever those little hard MA phases are present. So, uh, that That is a major problem and really the only way to try and uh, deal with that problem or to uh, prevent that high hardness is to basically temper those grains. And we did a study showing that yes, it is possible to temper those grains. And when we actually do the tempering uh, using the TEM, we can see in situ uh, a, a, a TEM microscope that has a heating stage uh, that heated to 300 C for, for 10 minutes we can actually see the dislocation density inside the MA decreasing and the overall uh, structure is changing so that you have uh, more ferrite and carbides actually nucleating during that tempering process. Well, so the last thing I wanted to, to uh, discuss uh, just the last few slides here is uh, the potential and uh, recent history of kind of one shot processes. So pipeline welding, again, almost everything in North America is done using traditional arc welding techniques where we weld one side and then the other side and multiple passes. What about doing everything in one shot, heating the material and just putting the material together? That's been attempted actually, and uh, even in Canada, there's research projects on this. Uh, one project looked at uh, magnetically impelled arc butt welding. So basically creating a small gap between the two pieces, creating an, uh, a magnetic field that causes the arc, uh, an arc to move around that gap. And as the two sides start to spark together and create a lot of sparks between them, you slam them together and um, create an upset or, or flash that joins the two sides together. Uh, so this has been investigated. Uh, Trans-Canada pipelines had looked at this back in the 90s. Uh, 
it was looked uh, well looking like suitable for small thin diameter pipelines, uh, but uh, it uh, really was difficult to scale up. And uh, one of the big concerns, aside from the scaling, is that um, you could only do really thin wall thicknesses. And when you start to go into thicker wall thicknesses, you tended to have a, a layer at the interface that provided a potential fracture zone. The other problem is that this flash, right, it created this uh, stress concentration that had to be leveled off, and that created a lot of problems because they, the grinding and, and removing of this flash is a time-consuming step. Uh, another interesting company in Calgary actually developed a induction heating system where we basically have the two ends of the pipe heated by an induction coil. After heating for a, a a few seconds, about 10 to 20 seconds, the coil is very quickly removed on a pneumatic cylinder and then the two pieces are moved together. Once they're in contact, then the two ends of the pipe are just spun, but they're only rotated about 30 to 90 degrees. It's only a small rotation like this, and sometimes it's going back and then back and forth. And that actually gives a much, much better weld uh, profile. We actually, this is, uh, the company is actually called Spinduction, and they actually prove this process is, is feasible for not only uh, pipeline steels, like X65 and so on, but also titanium and stainless and so on, and even dye uh, tool steels. And the really interesting thing is that we can provide either a nice uh, kind of uh, uniform bead profile at the joint, or it's even possible to make a completely a uniform smooth joint uh, using this technique. We analyzed some specimens uh, from this process and we found a really interesting microstructure was formed in that the heat affected zone basically just has fine grains and it just turns into finer and finer grains into the recrystallized zone. So I think this, uh, this process, this technique has uh, certainly a lot of potential remaining uh, but it certainly requires uh, a lot of optimization and better understanding of the thermal cycles for different uh, base metals. Uh, so that uh, kind of rounds off my, my talk. And uh, as you can see, you know, there have been many incremental improvements that have been made. So based on arc welding, we've been able to make some very significant uh, implement, uh, improvements based on incremental changes to the arc welding process. Um, Latest techniques for evaluating provide a much better understanding by combining basically modeling techniques with detailed microscopy to understand exactly what's controlling the strength of the joints. Um, but there are new methods uh, kind of constituting these one shot welding processes that have drastically different thermal cycles by, for example, not reaching the melting point. Uh, we can completely change the kind of microstructures that are produced in both the the weld metal and the heat affected zone using these one shot uh, techniques. So that's uh, everything from uh, for this uh, talk. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions and field discussion now. Yeah, thank you, Adrian. It's a I mean, wonderful talk. Uh, you know, you have uh, made us aware about, uh, about the different uh, types of uh, you know different modifications of the welding process to tackle the high productivity welding situations, specifically in the case of the pipeline. We talked about the additional wear uh, you know gas metal arc welding process, laser oblique welding process, and also the one shot welding process. So definitely uh, you know there will be some questions from the, the scholars, the large number of scholars. I can see that uh, they are present today. Uh, they are working in the field of the welding. But before I move to them, uh, you know, I do have some questions from my side. Like when you are talking about uh, the multiple wear, uh, the, the cold wear, uh, additional cold wear, uh, you know, the system, uh, as the number of wear increases, depending on the productivity, depending on the demand for the higher productivity, uh, you know, is there any relation between the feeding rate with the number of wear? Yeah, so they we've tended to yeah so we've noticed that a one usually one individual wire can only feed up to about uh, 60 to 80 percent of the electrode wire feeding rate 
But as the so, number square increases, then then uh, I mean. Yeah, we've we've only been managed to 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 feed two cold wires and achieve around about a hundred and twenty percent feeding rate with the two cold wires. Yeah. So each one is adding sixty percent extra, and so that seems to be kind of a limit because we started to introduce a lot of welding defects and have you know, unmelted wire within uh, the uh, actual pool after that point. And do you feel the need of preheating if the number of wire increases? Yeah, so that's the other thing. We, I haven't showed it in this talk, but that was the next development. We tried to introduce a third wire yeah. and actually resistively heat that wire so that we have a hot wire plus two cold wires plus the electrodes. So actually four wires in total being fed. And, and then uh, our, our deposition rates actually can uh, compete very nicely with submerged arc welding. Uh, we can uh, deposit, uh, you know, several uh, pounds per hour, more than 15 pounds per hour uh, using that kind of a system and actually have heat input that's um, actually less than half of what submerged arc welding has for heat input. So it has a kind of interesting characteristics that have a lot of new potential. Another, uh, you know, the question is coming up in my mind uh, in case of the laser obling welding. So you have mentioned about the different profile. Uh, does yeah. it, I mean, is there a relation between the profile and the welding speed? Because yeah, the circular profile and then the profile of the aid. So if I if I choose a particular profile, I, do I need to optimize the welding speed for that? Yeah, we we noticed that we we tended to have uh, kind of the best. Uh, wobbling characteristics with this kind of circular profile. And I think that is because uh, when the, the figure eight is, is being drawn on, uh, on the, the laser path, uh, you probably don't get as much, uh, I don't think you get as much of the wetting of the sidewalls and melting of the sidewalls as you should. Okay. So Good. yeah, certainly that changes the range of acceptable welding speeds for sure. But we only studied a couple of welding speeds that we're trying to compare to the existing literature. Yeah. So in my understanding, there may be some relation with the profile welding speed and the profile. Maybe the optimum welding speed for different profiles will be different. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. It's it's probably the case. So uh, if there are some questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, let me read uh, one by one. Can you see that chat box? Uh, oh, okay, I can see the chat. So uh, one person is asking about uh, micro alloying uh, with cobalt yeah. uh, to, modify, to, to modify the morphology of the MA phases. Uh, I've seen some literature on this. Uh, we we haven't uh, investigated uh, any kind of specially designed uh, wire uh, filler wires or specially uh, alloyed uh, with cobalt at this point. Um, generally, I think you know probably I think a lot of the industrial partners would prefer to to kind of stay away from very special formulations. Uh, with cobalt uh, is becoming a kind of an inconsistently available element sometimes, and uh, that can create uh, quite a bit of a problem in production, right? So when the availability, especially now, like during COVID and so on, that's uh, another, a whole other different set of issues of availability uh, is coming up. But uh, when we have, for example, a, a, a process that we qualify with one specific wire, it should be relatively insensitive to a small you know, wire change. So they typically like to approve a process with at least two common kind of commercial wires so that they can use both suppliers um, depending on availability. But yeah, you're, you're right. It, it, there's definitely a possibility that you can better control the MA, um, but we're not uh, necessarily um, looking at very many different uh, uh, base metals with different uh, uh, cobalt uh, additions in them. Uh, another question is, would it be different if we use the existing wire of a higher diameter instead of uh, additional cold wire? Uh, yeah, so the higher diameter, there is uh, 
a potential to use a larger diameter as well. But uh, what we have found is that it actually is, is better to use smaller diameter, uh, a larger number of smaller diameter wires, essentially because you're able to capture more of the, the heat that's irradiated and lost uh, to the environment. Um, but uh, yeah, that it is a possibility within a you know within a small range uh, of of parameters to just use a larger, thicker wire. Um, can solid state welding like FSW be used for pipes on site? Yeah, so there is uh, you can find on YouTube. There's some videos of a friction stir pipe welding machine uh, that was developed by uh, by Megaster in the U.S. Um, certainly, there are some potential applications there, but uh, the big, you know, the big issue is still remains to be the tooling, um, tooling materials, consistency of the tooling materials, and what happens to the tool material if it breaks or if it is uh, worn off and deposited in the weld metal. Um, the other issue is that you know the base metals are also very sensitive to the the heat input and so on it, it makes it very difficult to control the process when the base metal chemistry is not necessarily specified um uh, another uh, issue I, I adrian uh, in case of the pipe welding by uh friction star welding on site because uh, uh the mega star uh the equipment i think it's not for the on site uh, you know the pipe welding is it for the on site I... yeah it, it was possible to adapt it on site because uh it, it had a like a clamshell kind of device that could be yeah. uh, supported by a crane and then put on put onto the pipe. Um, but it you know it overall the funny thing is that it, it it's actually a much slower process than arc welding. And you are absolutely also, right. The the main concern is that the tooling tooling in case of the friction. The, the, yeah, the, the the tooling is a is a is an issue. But and in many applications, just by by having a process that introduces. A slower process creates uh, a time lag effect that that will cascade through the whole uh, welding, the, the whole construction process, right? So they they don't like to increase the time for welding very much um, because of that. But uh, yeah, you're right. That really, I think, still the biggest issues are the the tooling and the equipment design. Um, another question was: Did the crystallographic orientations of microstructures uh, affect the nano hardness. Um, yeah, so it definitely, that's why we had quite a bit of scatter in the nano hardness, nano indentation results. Uh, certainly you get di slightly different uh, hardness values with different orientations. So we always tend to measure at least five grains. So we have kind of five random orientations. And of course the scatter is always larger for nano hardness versus like micro hardness or, or rock wall hardness, something like that. Um, the other thing was, uh, um, is there any discontinuity of properties at the junction of the starting and ending points for pipe welding? Um, oh, at the starting and end points of the weld. Yeah, so there is, um, certainly that's a concern. Uh, they, they do a lot of in the field testing to check, uh, to see how the, uh, start and stop microstructures uh, differ, and that's usually just controlled by having uh, like a welding procedure specification that uh, has nice, um, like that has a nice uh, processing window that isn't affected too much by the start and stop uh, parameters. Because every welding um, equipment uh, usually has like a small kind of taper off phase at the end of the the weld. Um, and you have to overlap by a certain amount as well with the other uh, weld pass. So uh, there is some variation at those starts and stops for sure. I don't, is there any other questions? I don't think. If it, any other question is there from the scholars or the participants, please uh, put your questions in the chat box. Yeah. Sample size of tensile test for the pipe welding specimen. Uh, normally, normally we two, yeah. So normally they will test um, at least three uh, for that. So in most of our papers, though, when we we try to get a, a statistical average for for doing a confidence index 
a 95% confidence index, and that usually requires five tests for us. Actually, in case of the uh, one sort welding process, uh, uh, do you go for the preheating of the sample? So, yeah, the, the one-shot welding processes are not necessarily preheated. No, what they will do is they will, so the one that um, I was mainly talking about here, this uh, spinduction process, uh, it's only heating up the material at the induction stage. It's heating up the material, so it doesn't have to preheat. It's basically kind of a built-in preheat. And you mentioned about the that it is applicable for the uh, you know the lower thickness material. So can you give us some idea like what is the thickness of the material? The uh, well, so this so the the in the previous work in the nineties they were doing this magnetically uh, impelled arc butt welting, and that tended to work only for the lower thickness materials because to maintain an arc uh, and to maintain the electric. Uh, uh, electric uh, field potential across the pipe, thinner was much better, a more uniform process. But this this process is not sensitive to thickness. You can uh, you can do this process for a very wide range of thickness and even a solid pipe. But you have done, uh, I mean, uh, for the magnetically impelled, uh, you know, the bar welding process. So, I mean, what is the maximum thickness that you are welding? I believe the maximum for that one was about 12 millimeters. 12 millimeters. Okay. That's quite, quite, quite high for the pipe. Yeah, so, that's relatively thin for pipeline, yeah. They always try to achieve at least uh, capability for up to 25 millimeters. Yeah. I don't think any other uh, question in the chat box. Yeah. So, again, it's a really, uh, you know, the wonderful lecture giving us the uh, you know, the making us aware of the uh, modifications of the, the conventional and the non-conventional welding process. Uh, I am pretty sure that the, the participants have thoroughly enjoyed and we are privileged and we are honored really uh, for your presence over here. Thank well, you. It's my, it's my pleasure as well. Thank you very much for inviting me to, give this, to have this opportunity and uh, it's very good to see you again and, and connect with your group. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presence. Uh, I'd like to now request uh, uh, our team, Ananta, if you can just uh, let us know the, the, the speakers for the next weeks and all. Yeah, so the upcoming webinars in the month of, uh, you know, the, the September, the Deepankar Basu will be uh, talking about uh, the how to help the small and the medium sized manufacturing industries in India. Uh, then the next week would be by Dr. B.P. Gautam from the TCS research team, an integrated design and development of materials, products, and manufacturing process for accelerating product development, their deployment. And on the September 18th, we do have. Uh, you know, Dr. Preet Banerjee, who is that, you know, Chief Technology Officer, CTO of ANSYS. So he'll be talking about the digital trade. You can all, uh, you know, the watch the past webinars. Uh, you know, the we have already putting it in the Google Drive, in the YouTube as well. So you can just, uh, if you have some, you know, the missed any of the webinar, you can just watch there. So, with this, I would like to close today's uh, session. Thank you so much for your participation. And uh, we look forward to see you in the next week, Saturday, same time at 8.30 p.m. in India Center time. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Take care.